15 seed has knocked off a two seed in the NCAA tournament only eight times since the college basketball tournament was created in 1939. Jordan Hamilton is one of the very few individuals who have accomplished this feat. He was a member of the Lehigh men's basketball team that beat Duke in 2012. This experience, along with many years of traveling and professional basketball, led Jordan to studying positive psychology at Claremont. In this interview, we discuss what it means to tap into your individual flow and how that translates into group flow. We also discuss how mindfulness plays a role in our individual development. Jordan is extremely wise in these topics, and I hope you guys enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Flow Station Podcast. I'm your host, Will Ferris, and as always, the goal is to help you cultivate your unique flow by bringing on guests who have tapped into theirs. Speaking of someone who's tapped into theirs, I got my man, Jordan Hamilton, one of my mentors on the podcast today. Thank you for joining me, bro. Thanks for having me. What's been your current flow, bro? What have you been tapping into lately? And, and you know, you're always traveling and, and going around the world, but where, where have you been doing and, and tuning into now? Yeah, well, first of all, glad to be on here. Um, I love what you guys are doing, the Flow Station, and, <laughs> you know, and just pushing the message of flow and, yeah. and providing tools for others to experience this wonderful state. Um, I would say my current flow, uh, I traveled a fair amount this summer. Um, I took some opportunities to get outside, to get into nature, and to do some um, minor retreats, I'd say. Uh, but right now, um, my flow is group flow. So I've been diving into that construct and breaking it down and identifying subcomponents of how do we facilitate and create this state um, across different settings more frequently. So that's, you know, that's been my flow of, of late. Yeah, man. I think we, we spoke a couple of days before we got onto this podcast just about you know, what are the prerequisites of, of group flow? And obviously you had to tap into your own unique flow to, to really understand that at a, at a deeper level. So it'd be cool to hear just kind of your journey to flow and, and how you've understood this, you know, complex, you know, state over the years and, and, and maybe where it all started. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I first read and started to discover the concept of flow. Um, from and I, I wouldn't even say academic sense, but just reading about it, right? Because previous to that, I'd experienced it. I think we all have at different times, especially athletes. You know, you have those moments where you're locked in, and your confidence is high, and at some point, you're not even there anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then in college, I be, really became interested in the mental side of the game and how do I improve my performance mentally. And that's when I came across the book Flow, and um, I was like, "Oh, this is this is it right here. This is what I. This is why I poop, right? Yeah. Um, it's for this feeling and these moments, and not just a hoop, but in life to have these states and share this state with others. Because I think that, to me, you know, reflecting upon those moments where I've had that collective experience of flow, uh, are some of the most meaningful in my life." Um, so with that in mind, I began to consider and apply some of those principles while I was playing at Lehigh and also encourage uh, my teammates to do that as well. I was in a position um, as, as co-captain where, um, you know, together collectively with the team, we were able to shape our culture. And there were several moments throughout the season where we were able to enter these states. Uh, one in particular, I remember we were playing Williams and Mary, and we were similarly ranked. And uh, we were playing at their place, or at Liberty rather, close to their home court. And um, something clicked for us in the first half. And by the end of the first half, we were up 40 to 5. And that's uncommon in a Division One game. It, at any, you know, in any circumstance, let alone two mid-majors going at it. And what happened on the court um, was we were able to develop this con- interconnectedness to the point where um, coaches will talk about playing on a stream, right? Where every guy's connected. It's one thing to talk about, it's another thing to actually feel and experience it. Where I knew exactly where everyone was on the court, not only that, I knew where they would be mm-hmm. in the next moment. It was a very odd experience and I remember reflecting on that and, and considering and wondering, like, what, what just happened? What went on there? Um, so that and several other um, experiences in team sports, and then also in conversation, 
um, led me to this study. I think in conversation is another um, point that where you have really deep philosophical conversations where um, each person is building on an idea. And all of a sudden, it's as if you're co-creating these new models, these new ways of thinking, and you almost know exactly what the other person's going to say before they say it. Um, a lot of times, we these moments come and then they go, um, rather than stepping back and saying, "Okay, how how did this occur? What were the steps that we took mm. um, in order to allow this to happen?" Because with flow and group flow. It just happens, right? But yeah. I think there are certain things that can be done to increase the frequency of the occurrence, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I know there's so much trial and error, but one question I have for you is, you know, when you've tapped into these flow experiences, especially at Lehigh, you know, with a team flow, and you guys understand, like, wow, we just hit something that's that's pretty deep. I think the tendency, right. at least for me in the past, was like, it's kind of like you said, is like force it, some, like, oh, let's get into it again, let's get into it again, but it's really an organic feeling so what are the what are the processes that that team went through and, and you individually to where you understood all right it's not something you force but there are what are the little minor things that you can do to, to put yourself in a better position to be in that state yeah yeah I think you know it's not a perfect science at least not yet um, but there are some fundamental requirements right um, one thing that our team had that you know further down the line, I learned that research supports as well, is everyone was able to be themselves, mm. right? Um, where we had a culture where, regardless of where you came from, regardless of how you thought, how you dressed, whatever, um, you could be you could be yourself. And yeah, you might, you know, guys might joke around, but there was never any attacks on the character of that individual, right? So because of that, there is this freedom and this autonomy, and we were able to build this sense of trust because we really knew who one another was at, mm -hmm. at a fundamental level, you know? Um, so because we established that baseline, what, you know, the, the term is psychological safety, which is um, feeling safe to express yourself as you are, feeling safe to fail without the repercussions of, of being, um, having your, you know, being, your character being damaged from that. Um, so we were able to establish that, and that's one component. We'll, another one is we were all committed to a common goal. So at the beginning of the season, we decided as a team that we wanted to make it past the first round. And I think there's deciding on a common goal, and then there's truly believing in the mm -hmm. common goal. And um, we were fortunate that we had, you know, we had a lot of confidence both in ourselves and as individuals and one another. You know, we felt like there were seven guys on the team that against whoever could score 20. And I think we had that, you know, we had at least seven guys have 20 during the season. Um, so we had a lot of confidence. And, um, and I think it's important to extend that confidence beyond one, yourself to each one, one another. And that's those, those two, that two combination of allowing everyone to be themselves, uh, trusting one another, having confidence in one another, and then having all that be directed towards a single goal that's a formula for success, you know, and you can take that model and apply it to whatever team you're, you're playing on. And, um, I believe in, in research indicates that that will improve performance. When you talk about this ability to be yourself, be true to yourself in a group setting. And I think that's part of flow is having that autonomous nature where, you know, you can do the act for the act itself and there's not really this big ego or, or, or you're doing it for an external thing. But how do you, how do you develop that? I guess in a team sense, is is that really is that trickle down from the leader, the coach, or is that something where an individual on the team is opening up of who they are and the struggles they go through and and create like a culture where people can do that, or is it just you guys got lucky, a bunch of individuals didn't really care and they were able to be themselves and and they knew who they were. Yeah, you know, and that's a great question. I think you know, in our case. A lot, you know, a lot of it was I got to give it up to the coaching staff, right? Because they recruited the right guys. Yeah. You know, they went out and they found guys that fit this culture, and um, they recruited a lot based on people, you know, which not every team does. Um, but that being said, um, to your point of where does that come from? Does it come from leader? Um, I believe in, in sort of a, a shared leadership model, right? Where especially on teams, you might have an appointed leader, like okay, yeah, you might, you know, Will, you might be captain, right? Um, and 
that role, you may act as a leader in certain areas. And then you have a guy who might never play, but when he speaks, people listen. Yeah. I believe that on team, there's, there's multiple leaders. And ideally what you have is, you know, you have guys at the top who are willing to be vulnerable as well. And it doesn't necessarily mean you need to talk about your struggles all the time. It could just be like being goofy, right? Mm. Or not taking yourself too seriously. So we had a bunch of guys, one of, one of my uh, roommates, uh, Justin Maneri, he, you know, really talented, didn't get as much playing time as he wanted, but he was constant. He was just out there, you know, and, and people were like, oh man, here goes Maneri again. But because of that, he was so loose that yeah. he allowed others to loosen up around him. Mm. So, you know, having guys like that, um, I think are incredibly valuable to the team and, you know, um, and, it, so it starts with everyone, right? Because it starts with multiple people who have influence on the team. Just not buying into the, I have to be cool, which is such, it, it's a facade, right? And it's an, it's an illusion and it's a construct that will eventually become dated in a few years, right? Mm-hmm. So um, the more and the more people can be vulnerable, be goofy, be themselves, talk about their struggles, whatever that may look like, the more trust can be built within a team. What if what if you have something that you're vulnerable and you're you're around a team that that isn't you know you you have a collective yeah. group um, I guess that's that's where I we could take it now is where do you tap into that vulnerability where okay you don't have someone who's going to support that and, and and reimburse that to you um, how do you how do you buffer that you know what what level do you do you have to get to in your own being to to be able to accept all right. You know, I'm going to be who I am, even if people don't accept that. And even if the team doesn't rally around that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, you know, I would say that takes, uh, it takes maturity. It takes inner development. And one method to do that, you know, through meditation, um, there are different tools you could fig- you can use to know yourself. Um, and to the more you, for example, and meditation is just one example, right? But the more you practice meditation, the less attached you become to this idea of will or this for me this idea of jordan right and the, as you decrease your attachment to this idea um the opinion of others to that idea which you no longer identify as strongly with um becomes less severe so you know mm. when someone they, you may not feel received well received or you bring up a point that others laugh at you know, you don't feel the the sting, the same sting that you might if you really believe in this idea of mm-hmm. will. Um, and that may sound abstract, but another way to say it is, um, you know, this version of you right now. If you think back to yourself at 12 years old, you're like, man, what was I doing, mm-hmm. right? Well, the same thing's going to happen when you're 30, looking back at yourself at 21. Right. So if you can understand how that perception changes, you can I, you can start to uh, realize that maybe I shouldn't take this version of myself so seriously. Yeah. And maybe I should start to do things that make me happy and that make me fulfilled. And so I think that discovery of finding ways to act that at the end of the day, you're like, OK, this was me. Um, the more you can do that, the better off you'll be. And the, it's contagious. Right. Yeah. It's contagious. So when when did you find your development in, in these practices? You know, I remember you took me out after an open gym, did some qigong, something that I've never done. But then I had the whole whole squad doing it when we were in Taiwan. And I just think there's yeah. a there's a different element that 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 brings. That's not something I practice too much. But meditation has been something that I've, I've tuned into. And, you know, there's positive and negative results from that. But right. what have you what have you learned along that journey? And, and what did you when did you start that process of looking inward and trying to find your truth and and, and what uh, practices do you use to do that? Yeah, yeah, so I, I really got into this uh, in college. So uh, I was starting, that's when I started to practice Qigong and different meditations. And um, what initiated that, as I mentioned, was you know my inability to perform consistently. And a lot of that had to do with uh, confidence, uh, anxiety, and um, and really this, this realization that I have this, my skill set's the same. Mm-hmm. It's more my ability to access my skill set consistently. That's where the variance is. So how can I find some, uh, some, a sustainable solution to be able to do that? 
And so I started trying everything, man. I think that's something that's cool about athletes, right? You got, like, if you, like, there's not everyone you could say, like, hey, go stand in that freezing room, <laughs> right? Where you got to put on these gloves <laughs> and these things on your feet. And uh, if you stay more, if you stay five minutes, you might die. But <laughs> two minutes is fine, you know? Not a lot of people are going to do, like, sign me up, right? But athletes do that because they're willing to do whatever it takes to get better. So that's the kind of mentality I had. And uh, because of that, I was doing, you know, some funky stuff for college, a college student. I was doing Qigong, I was walking around barefoot, you know, but the more I started to practice and feel these benefits, the more I felt comfortable expressing that side of myself. And, you know, to your point, meditation is not a linear path, right? So it's not every time it gets better and better and better. It's more like this, right? Mm. Uh, the general, it generally trends upward, but you can't always see those markers, right? You could practice for six months straight and you're like, I don't feel any difference. But maybe six months ago when you'd get on the road, someone cuts you off, you know, you're throwing the middle finger up and you're cursing at them. And then... You know, you're having that same thought, man, nothing's changed as someone cuts you off and you're like, have a nice day, right? Mm. It was harder to notice the changes, I think. They just happen and then that, that might be that moment to moment realization. Um, and I certainly experienced that and became frustrated at times. Um, one of the best things I heard regarding mindfulness or meditation was that um, yeah, I had been practicing for 20 years and someone asked him, you know, what's the best, what's your best? most spectacular experience you've had in meditation and he's like i don't really keep track of those you know th what i realized is i my conclusion after every day is like uh you know my mind was busy today or my mind wasn't as busy today mm. it's just you're just looking at your mind and letting it do what it does some days it'll be more active some days it'll be less active and um to have that approach i think without being attached to these outcomes that's when you really receive the benefits yeah, that's beautiful, man. I think that's that's something that I've learned, you know, the hard way. You know, I used to think meditation's like, oh, this is supposed to tune me in every single time. So it, so I would sit longer. I would try to go harder. And then once yeah. I understood that it's, like you said, you kind of let the mind do what it does. And you're, it's almost like a skill to learn how to just be with what is. What are some precautionary things you would say to people who want to begin a mindfulness or meditation practice that maybe some pitfalls you fell into early that, you know, you can warn them about? Yeah. Well, what you just described there, I think, is beautifully put. And um, so the mindfulness certification that I have is in Unified Mindfulness. And they have a lot of great free videos you can look at. And um, they identified three components of mindfulness, concentration, uh, sensory clarity, and then equanimity. Mm -hmm. And equanimity is what you just described, which is accepting what is. And um, what I would say is when you're starting to practice, that is one of the most useful um tools to have or ideas to keep with you, right? How often can you just accept whatever it is? And uh, that could be related to as you sit down for five to 10 minutes, the chaos in your mind. It could be as you walk throughout your day, a problem comes up, it presents itself, and you just, how can you accept what is in the moment? Mm -hmm. I think that's the core of a lot of these practices. It's not to try to change yourself or to change the circumstances, but accepting what is. Um, there's this equation where uh, suffering equals pain times resistance. Mm. So by accepting, you're removing that resistance, and then pain is just what it is right and it'll dissolve and go away it's just a stimuli that comes up where we're, we need to be aware of this feeling it could be this feeling or this physical sensation that's going on and then if you're not resisting it it'll dissolve and go away it's like okay you notice it good we're done mm -hmm. here. you know message received yeah um i would say for starting to practice you know the the, the biggest thing i've noticed in myself and, and hearing from others is having um having someone to hold you accountable so, so start with a reasonable time, right? Start with, you know, 10, I think 20 minutes a day is ideal. And like schedule that time every day, you know, that fits into your schedule. Schedule that time every day and have someone that's gonna hold you accountable. And, um, and think about a reason why you're doing it, you know? Um, I think to it's easy to do it for a week or two and then something comes up and, and you right. lose you lose focus or whatever. Um, 
but to really, and, and I think also to think of it as an investment in yourself, right? You're not, this isn't like, it's not like a quick diet or a lot of these fads. This is a long-term investment, right? Mm-hmm. This is like buying the bonds or real estate. You know, this isn't, you're not going, you're not, this isn't like quick stock purchase here. This is a long-term investment. And I just commit to that, you know, to commit to that for a certain amount of time and then see what happens. Yeah. No, that's beautiful, man. Um, so moving on a little bit from mindfulness, I know we'll get back to it, but uh, you play professionally overseas and, and like we spoke before, you took a quite a big risk doing it. Um, so just talk about, you know, what was your motivation to take that risk and, and what you learned from that journey and, you know, just why, why you were able to go out of your comfort zone, you know, at that period of time in your life and, and what you learned from it. Yeah, um, so I played, I played um, out of college, I went to Canada, and I played in Canada for one year. And then when I came back from that, um, I made I made the choice not to go back and play. Um, because I saw I thought that I had some other opportunities here. And what I noticed, what I realized in hindsight was that um, I chose not to play, I, I wasn't really listening to my true self, mm. right? I wasn't, I was, I was making decisions with my mind rather than my heart. And it sounds cliche, but in my mind, here's a business opportunity that's potential to do this, that, and the other. Whereas my heart was saying, look, man, you want to hoop, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you love hoop. So I didn't go back and play. And because of that, I had this gap of a year where I had no film. Uh, I, you know, I didn't have an agent or anything and I still wanted to play. So I was like, okay, what do I do? So I made the commitment that I was going to try for one year to go and continue to play basketball. And, you know, I, I did the work on the court. Um, and then I also started, I put together my own profile. I started just sending, I had sent out hundreds of emails to teams. Right. And then I decided to go stay with my buddy who was in Luxembourg. And and part of the reason for the decision was like, I know I want to hoop and I got to do whatever I can to do it. And if I fall on my face, if I don't get a deal, that's okay. But if I don't try right now, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. And it's also being able to practice what I preach, right? I also thought forward to being 45, 50 and, and talking to my kids or coaching. I was coaching at the time as well. And I imagine telling these kids, you know, I'm telling these, I'm telling these very talented seventh graders to pursue basketball with everything you've got right and to commit fully to this dream and you'll never have any regrets and i had to look at myself and be like oh, am i doing that yeah so it was really based on you know i want to uh, walk my talk so i went over there and ended up staying in my buddy's apartment in luxembourg um just sleeping on the floor and was still hitting up teams you know i was hitting up teams i was taking the bus to different tryouts um the train at times and uh, i was fortunate enough to land to land a gig and um and move out and move into my own apartment and hoop right and then on that it was was wild as uh i got the gig because someone got hurt so my contract was for eight weeks hmm. i was playing a four i'm not a four i'm a two three <laughs> so they're like yo you need 15 boards a game i'm like okay <laughs> right um I didn't get there, but I got close. I got close. Uh, so after the eight weeks, they're like, listen, we like you, but we, we, you know, we got, we got our guy coming back from an injury. We don't have enough money to pay for you. So I was like, okay. So at this point I had another three weeks on my visa. So basically I had to find a team in three weeks or I got to go back home and I had to leave the apartment I was living in. So, well, I'd, I, at this point, I'd connected with an agent. I had film, so I was in a better position. Um, but I think this, so for three weeks, uh, you know, I ended up finding a friend to stay with. And um, and I was practicing with one of the top teams over there. So I was staying in shape, staying engaged. And a week before my visa ran up, I got a call from my agent. He said, listen, I've got a team for you in Germany. Mm. Get, on a, get on a bus tomorrow. <laughs> not a bus get on the train tomorrow and go to room door and um and that's where i ended up playing for the rest of the season but i think the biggest thing i learned from that whole experience was um being comfortable in in discomfort yeah and and 
when you can uh, when you can appreciate it when you can appreciate that feeling and because really it, it's just it's amplifying life you never feel more alive right when you when you're pursuing your dream and and there's tension or there's stress right uh it's it's odd to say but looking back you know those were some of the that uncertainty those were some of the you know that's some of the most alive i've ever felt and i think that that's what comes from really pursuing your passions even if it doesn't look like a clear cookie cutter path right um the satisfaction and fulfillment you get is you, you can't, you can never pay for that, right? There's no way to replicate that other than to do it and to know that you've gone through it and and a lot of help from you, from others, from committing to that. And also when you commit to something like that, when you take that leap, I believe that there are universal forces that support that, mm. right? And, and um, you can make of that what you want, but when you take that and you fully go in, uh, trust that you will be supported. That's awesome, man. That's that's such a cool story. I didn't I didn't hear, I didn't know the whole background of that, but that's that's pretty crazy, bro. Yeah, it was wild. In three it weeks. Wild. I, I can speak <laughs> glamorously about it now, but man, it was yeah. stressful at the time, right? Yeah, man. Uh, you know, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. That's awesome, man. Um, so you become, you know, you go back, and now you're studying positive psychology. What was the motivation to do that and, and how have you tied it into just the consulting that you've done with teams and, and different individuals and, and what you've learned from that journey as well? Yeah, so um, I, I chose CGU, uh, the school I'm at now, because uh, the author of Flow, uh, Mahali Csikszentmihalyi, he was a professor here. Um, he retired a year after I got here, so I didn't get much oh, time. Wow. But, um, but because of that, the foundation set, and I really wanted to figure out I wanted to figure out flow and I wanted to study group flow in particular. I wanted to know what are the underlying constructs that allow this to happen because I think not only it's, I think it's a fundamental human state. I think that it's something that we've engaged in uh, the entire history of our species and that we're losing touch with. And it provides a sense of intimate connectedness mm. that can actually really help bring people together and um, solve this this uh, really epidemic of lack of belonging, lack of connection, and um, lack of identification with one another, right? As a species, as as a brothers and sisters, and all part of the, this human team. Um, so that's kind of like that's the very big picture, and um, and through that, you know. One thing I'm working on now, um, which is looking at how we can use technology to help identify when we're in this state, right? So in flow, they're using different biomarkers. Um, neuroscience is starting to identify that, for example, when you're in flow, the, your prefrontal cortex, this front part of your brain, is activated, right? So um, you know, looking at in group flow, is that is it similar, right? Um, how what are what are people's breathing like are we all breathing together when we're in that state so what are some really fundamental and tangible um signs that were really connected that then we could replicate so that we're able to be here more to it be in this state together more often because it's an incredibly productive and creative space uh, a lot of organizations apply certain principles especially for innovation and and creativity that attempt to facilitate this because when people are able to go here together you know that's where the magic happens so to speak yeah and something that i've studied a little bit lately is just the dopamine serotonin and those reactions that that go on in the brain when you know when we are disconnected or when we are connected um and there's so many distractions that we have now you know phone social media right. do you feel like that's been something that's inhibited flow in, in a variety of ways in, in the individual and also in a group setting? I think so. And I think, you know, with individually, um, you know, a huge component of being able to enter flow is, is concentration mm -hmm. and your attention, you know, and social media, for example, is, I think deteriorates our ability to focus and hold our attention, mm -hmm. right? Um, an easy test to do this is meditate, wake up and then meditate immediately, then wake up 
scroll through your phone for five minutes and try meditating. Mm -hmm. And notice how the pace of your brain changes and you might notice also more of a challenge to focus on your breathing, for example. Um, and for in a group setting, uh, we've become so used to communicating digitally that we've, it seems like we've lost some innate ability to connect in person and, um, and aren't, as comf aren't necessarily as comfortable collectively engaging and really being vulnerable in a, in a group setting. So I think, it, I think it plays a huge role. And in my opinion, um, you know, something as you look for into the future, um, you look at where the, where are the gaps going to be, right? And the skill sets of it, it basically, in, in the skill sets of humans. Um, and this could be applied to, you know, what type of career you want to have, what do you want to do? How do you want to solve problems? I think a huge gap is going to be in social skills and social awareness. Um, and those are both really essential in developing community and developing functional teams. Um, so by, you know, stepping away or at least starting to acknowledge how our, you know, how our interaction with social media might be affecting us in their aspects of our lives. I think that's the first step. I'm not saying delete your accounts, mm, yeah. go into the woods or, or start a, start a cult. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that just becoming aware yeah. of, of how that might be interfering, interfering with your ability to connect. Yeah, that's very well put. Um, and you, you, I know you're, you've been consulting with teams about group flow and, and we, before, you know, a couple of days ago, we talked about, you know, teams like the Golden State Warriors when, you know, when they see a guy that's going off like Steph and, and right. then the group's, you know, duty is to keep that guy going and have group facilitators like Draymond Green who, you know, feed him the ball and get the ball moving. Um, you know, what does that take for some, for a team to, to really embody that group flow? and to have guys who are willing to be facilitators that may not get the credit at the end of the day, but they're, they're there to keep the flow going and, and what that means in the long run. I, I mean, that's a great point. And, um, and I think it comes down to in order to be really successful collectively, there has to be some sacrifice of ego. And this doesn't mean that the individual isn't included in this equation, right? There's this idea that, okay, I either have to give myself up, I have to give myself up for the team, not necessarily, right? What you have to do or what you can do is just put the team success slightly above yours, right? Mm -hmm. It's not one or the other. It's just the team success might just be a little higher. And when you have a group of guys that all do that, that's when egos diminished, and now all of a sudden you're becoming to form this collective ego, right? You're giving up some of your ego to become really an entity of your own, mm. the culmination of everything that you are, that you are collectively. And that has this magnetic effect. Um, and to that end, a lot of that can be boiled down to this belief that if you guys are successful collectively, everyone wins. Mm. Example is on the Lee team, right? Everyone that wanted to play overseas did. Right. Everyone that wanted a contract did because everyone knew about us because we were successful as a team. I averaged, I think, six points, like two rebounds. Well, you know, my numbers weren't great, but everyone knew about me because of what we did, what we accomplished. Um, and I think those roles, those Draymond Greens, are increased, becoming increasingly valued. You looked at how he got paid, right, the yeah. other day, right? Look at his numbers. It doesn't. It might. It, it, it doesn't make sense to someone that doesn't know the context of the game. And this, you could have mapped that across to whatever it is, whether you're, you know, it's business, it's a different sport, you're in music. Having someone that is aware of how to increase the effectiveness of the team at any given moment, of knowing what to do to make people around them better, is invaluable. Mm. And I was like, that's why guys like Pete. That's why PJ Tucker is on the U.S. Olympic team right now, mm -hmm. right? Because he's recognized by the best coaches, you know. There's no doubt that Pop's like, yeah, that guy. Yeah. Right. Because he's he's instrumental to his team's success. So there's more recognition of that, and um, I think it's you know, it, it's it takes some adjusting because we're so used in this culture to think of um, to put the, our individual needs first and to strive that it, it it takes some readjusting of how we're perceiving ourselves and the world around us to adjust to that. But it, it you know, it, the shift's happening. 
while you know they everybody might have a different role on a team or you know in their life some people might have to score more points or some people might have to you know assist the ball more rebound more but I think everybody can be a group facilitator and flow so what what is kind of like a prerequisite I guess for the individual to to tap into that team flow and and how does the mental wellness and well-being tie into that yeah so um you know, I, so I do. I, I do sort of two different streams of consulting that are really the same, right? Mm. Performance and then mental wellness, and both have. So, with mental wellness, the research indicates there are really two um, fundamental components or deficiencies that relate to uh, that cause some of these, you know, depression, anxiety, and uh, that you know may or may not. There's a lot. Obviously, it's very complex, right? There's there's neurochemistry that is a huge factor as well. But, um, but two huge aspects are one, lack of resources, internal resources to be able to cope with stress. So not having the skills necessary to deal with the challenges of life. And then two is not feeling like you belong. So those are two huge com- fundamental components that dictate how um, you know, our mental wellness or how well we're able to integrate. And I think like a huge focus is you know, for someone who wants to be a facilitator is how can you help people cope with challenges you know, how can you cope with challenges and how can you facilitate a sense of belonging amongst your group, right? And that goes back to some of the vulnerability we're talking about. Mm-hmm. I'm vulnerable. Now, people are like, hey, you know what? I'm, I felt weird like that too. And they may not say anything, but now all of a sudden they're like, there's a sense of belonging at a very fundamental level that can be established. Mm. Roofing, even if it's being weird, like, oh, I, I think some weird stuff sometimes. You know what I mean? He mm-hmm. just said it. Um, that, that's the way to just to get that fundamental level and to do that requires a level of social awareness It requires that you're able to step outside of yourself outside of your own insecurities um, you know your own challenges your own ego get out of your own way and consider okay what do what do other people around me need mm-hmm. you know or how can I you know one of the best uh, uh, really philosophies that anyone had mentioned to me is, is a mentor of mine said, you can ask yourself, there's two questions, two ways you can walk through life. One is to think of, you know, how does the room affect me or how can I affect the room? And this is in reference to walking into any space. And one is, you know, you walk into a room or you're like, man, I don't, I don't like the vibes of these people or I don't, I don't want to do this. And the other one would be like, walk into the room. Okay. Like, okay, how can I change this month, the environment around me? How can I uplift it to create a more positive experience for myself and for others? And I think it's that second approach, um, that is, anyone is capable of and anyone is capable of developing social awareness. Um, it just requires the effort and the ability to step outside of yourself. Yeah. That's beautiful, man. That's, that's really cool. Um, so yeah, I mean we've we've hit on a bunch of different things, mindfulness and and different ways yeah. to tap into group flow. But you know, let, let's talk about you a little bit. What's what's maybe one peak performance that you feel like you've had, you know, over your career in hoops or, or you know anything outside of hoops uh, that you feel like you tap deeply into the flow and, and is really you know obviously you, you you have passion for this topic, you have passion for what flow is. Um, you know, what's one thing that really pushed you to to pursue it? Yeah, man, that's a Wow. Okay. Uh, there's been, there's a lot of directions we can go here. <laughs> um, you know, we've been talking a lot about hoop. So what I'll say is, um, you know, what comes up for me is this moment when I played, it was over the summer, um, in college and I was back in, um, I was back in Seattle. And I was playing open gym at CLU, or not CLU, SPU. And I was working on my game. And I've been putting in a lot of work, working on these very fundamental details and, and specific aspects. And I remember going out on the court that day, and it was as if everything, all that work had integrated. And I remember when I was playing, it was as if I was no longer conducting this vessel, right? Um, Every, all the skills and everything was within me was communicating flawlessly on its own. Um, And time was slowed down. So I was able to execute 
these moves that I've been practicing, right? Um, they just came up. It wasn't intentional. They just, it came up at the right time. And um, it was when this, you know, these, this, these odd moments where time seems to be stretched, right? Where you, the defender, you can actually, you already know that they're going to, you're going in one way and you know that they're going to go over. I'm watching them and I can see them as soon as they start to move and I shift. And then it's just, it's time, right? Time is relative. And when you're really focused and concentrated and you're in a state of flow, you're able to play with time mm. in a weird way. So that was when I was like, that was, and I had similar experiences, but that was when I was starting to learn more about the mind. And that's when I clicked like, yo, this is possible. And, um, and since then, um, I, you know, recently, and now that basketball is over, um, it's through working, it's through speaking and, and podcasting and, uh, and still hooping, right? I still get buckets, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it's, 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 it's stepping in front of others and, um, and these moments of where I don't even really know what I'm saying, right? Um, and trusting that, uh, that the information I have inside will come out. I've been tuning into your podcast. You've, you've been putting out, you, have, you guys have five episodes now. It's called About Being Alive. I'll, I'll leave the, the link in my description. Uh, very cool. Always starts with a little mindfulness uh, technique or, 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 or practice. Um, so if people who want to get started on, on their practice, they can learn from you guys. And then you guys go into positive psychology, different, different elements and, and things that I've been able to take and upgrade myself. So you know, what inspired starting the podcast and what do you hope to uh, provide for people that tune in? You know, uh, I've been thinking about it for a while and then I was walking through campus one day and I walked by a room and I stopped, I looked back and there's a studio. And so I walked in and talked to talked to my man Anthony in there. I was like, what's going on? He's like, oh, we do podcasts. I'm like, oh, really? Can I, can I do one? He's like, yeah, sure. So that's kind of how it started. And uh, my buddy Jason and I, uh, we worked together on a few projects. And, you know, we, we, we both considered, you know, different avenues of, of kind of spreading the word of what we do. And it just came together. And it's been, it's, it's so much fun. You know, we're, we're still learning. I feel like we're getting better every time. And um, it, it's a great exercise for us. And hopefully, you know, it, it provides some value to listeners. Yeah, definitely, man. Really appreciate you coming on and, and spreading your wisdom. Hopefully uh, they go check out your podcast as well, and, and we have you on again. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, check out the uh, podcast about being alive. It's on uh, on iTunes. Um, if you have any questions about that, we take questions from listeners. You can find me on IG at Jordan Hamilton Zero. And then, um, you know, I also have a website that's still under construction, but got most of it up there, and that's jordanhamiltonconsulting.com. Awesome, man. Well, thank you, brother. Blessings. It's always a, always a pleasure to hear uh, hear what you're up to and, and the insights that you give me. Always, you know, something to work on. So thank you very much, man. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate what you're doing and enjoy Slam. Thank you guys for tuning into the Flow Station podcast. If you enjoyed it, please rate it, share with your friends, and uh, follow us on Instagram at Flow Station Podcast or Twitter at The Flow Station. Um, more content on the way, more guests and uh, more flowing to do. Appreciate you guys. Have a good one.